I'm going to be presenting the topic of should we be using beta-lactam TDM or can we just use infusions of beta-lactams uh, and what is the difference between those. Now this talk uh, aims to complement the talk which will be uh, a recorded presentation from uh, Associate Professor Mo al Shear, who's from Florida in, in the States. And uh, so I will go through some of the aspects of TDM uh, very briefly because Mo has done a fantastic job at covering some of those, uh, those aspects. So I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to hope that, that comes through just well. No, it's... Okay, all right, that should work now. All right, so uh, this is my presentation topic. Do we need beta-lactam TDM or can we just use prolonged in infusions? The contents of what I'll discuss uh, are what is altered PKPD after a short introduction, talk about dose optimization approaches for beta-lactams, and then of course, what is the current status of beta-lactam TDM and prolonged infusions? And then which one should we be leaning towards in the context of providing optimal care to patients with severe infections? So I guess the first topic that I want to discuss is this issue about should we, why can't we use that one dose fits all approach, which is able to be used for many drugs in many other uh, parts of medicine. And when we understand where drug doses come from and the subtleties of dosing in the context of antibiotics, it becomes quite clear that the, uh, the, the need for personalizing dosing in different uh, clinical syndromes is very important. And so in terms of where doses come from, well, a lot of them are born out of a laboratory situation with in vitro infection models. Uh, which are able to define what exposure of drugs or what concentrations of drug optimally kill a, uh, a bacteria, a pathogen, uh, you know, whatever that type of pathogen may be. And then once that exposure of drug has been defined, often in a very controlled uh, PKPD uh, type experiment, then that exposure is uh, then uh, ex tested in relatively healthy uh, people, often healthy volunteers, to make sure that it is, is tolerable. Uh, so I'm just going to swap displays here. Often to make sure that it's tolerable uh, to, the, uh, to a human subject. And then these are then advanced once it has been confirmed that that exposure is tolerable and the kinetics of the drug in the humans are known, that it's advanced into clinical trials with relatively homogenous cohorts of patients. And of course, in this context, that is the patient population that the, 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 the drug dosing regimens have been validated in, not in all the different types of patients that uh, may receive that, that drug. And therefore the question is, if the drug behavior is different to those patient populations in whom the clinical trials were done, does that mean that that dosing regimen is actually appropriate in those different groups? Well, of course, the answer to that is that if the drug behavior or the pharmacokinetics is different to that seen in the registration trials, and it is significantly different, then you may not be achieving those exposures of drug which have, uh, which have been targeted from the initial definition of what those exposures should be in the uh, in vitro infection models. So this means that there are patient populations which may be not only those in the intensive care unit, but also other parts of the, the hospital as well, such as the, the renal and uh, liver wards, patients with obesity or the burns ward, cystic fibrosis, patients receiving various forms of extracorporeal therapies, whereby by using just a, a, a standard dose, we won't get those kind of exposures that we are aiming to achieve. And therefore that means that uh, we risk not achieving exposure of drug, which is going to be associated with maximal efficacy, and of course would risk failure of, of um, therapy. Of course, uh, antibiotics can't really be titrated to some measurable end of needle effect. You know, we can't measure uh, the blood pressure of uh, 
and a vasopressor drug like we're able to for titrating vasopressors, you know, we don't have those, those subtle clinical symptoms which uh, rapidly adapt as soon as we're having successful treatment being defined or highly unsuccessful treatment occurring. And so therefore, uh, having PKPD targets and making sure that we are able to achieve those is very important to optimising therapy in these very, very unwell patients. So in terms of altered PKPD, and this is a topic which Mo will go into in a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to pre um, present this spectrum of altered pharmacokinetic possibilities that can occur in some patient groups. Here I have it presented in the context of critical illness, but really there is a spectrum of pharmacokinetic possibilities that can occur, and they're all driven by physiological changes. And so if we have some patients that have very hyperdynamic circulation, which can then lead to increased perfusion of eliminating organs, and then for high clearance drugs can mean that that drug has um, a greatly elevated clearance and therefore leading to low drug concentrations, you know, that is, uh, demands the need really for higher drug doses to be used. Alternatively, at the other end of the spectrum, we can have patients that have organ support requirements, uh, such as renal replacement therapy or ECMO, and the effects of these on drug dosing requirements are actually a little bit less clear, with some uh, recommended dosing adjustments being far too uh, severe and others not being severe enough in terms of what dosing should be used in those scenarios. And so when thinking about all of these different scenarios, it becomes clear that we can't use a singular dose in all patients with severe infection. The question is, well, what dose do we use? And when we look at what types of concentrations manifest in critically ill patients, this is data from the DALI study that I'm sure many of you have seen before. Uh, this is a point prevalence pharmacokinetic study conducted in uh, 450 critically ill patients. And this is the data for uh, 380 patients receiving a beta-lactam antibiotic. And the main point to take away from here is looking at the PKPD ratio. So that's the concentration of the drug halfway through the dosing rule versus the MIC of the known or suspected pathogen. You can see there is a huge level of pharmacokinetic variability. Of course, many patients here didn't uh, achieve what we would even consider to be a minimum uh, concentration of drug which is appropriate for therapy and those patients were three times more likely to fail treatment. But getting back to this issue about well how do we dose optimize in these patients if there is such variability, well that is the fundamental question because uh, this pharmacokinetic variability really is what drives the uncertainty in prescribing for clinicians. So what are some of these dose optimization strategies that we can use for beta-lactams whereby we maximize the likelihood of efficacy of a drug but also minimize the likelihood of toxicities which are increasingly being described particularly neurotoxicities. Well as always it depends on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug and as you'll see in Mo's presentation the beta-lactams are time-dependent drugs whereby maintaining, maintaining the concentration of the beta-lactam above some threshold uh, which is most commonly defined to be the, the minimum inhibitory concentration of the infecting pathogen is what is associated with um, uh, maximal bacterial killing. And so the best way to achieve this isn't necessarily with just using higher bolus doses because the magnitude of those doses relative to the increased time by the MYC really is, doesn't justify that approach. Uh, we could use more frequent doses because from a uh, a pharmacokinetic viewpoint that does increase the time by the MIC, but it isn't a very convenient approach to use because you're asking for the, the nursing staff to return to the bedside uh, with much greater frequency to be administering those doses. And so you know, it, it may not very well align with the health system possibilities. The next option is prolonged infusions. Now, prolonged infusions can be categorized in terms of either extended infusion, which typically runs for about half of the dosing interval. So if a drug is being administered every eight hours, then that infusion would run for four hours. Uh, or it could be categorized as a continuous infusion, whereby the, the infusion of the drug essentially runs throughout the day. Uh, and if the drug has reduced stability, then the, uh, the, the drug is just administered 
at durations, in fusion durations, which match that stability. So with meropenem being a very good example of a drug with reduced stability, we might give that as three eight hour infusions. In terms of the likelihood of uh, prolonged infusions to increase the possibility of achieving uh, a target concentration, we can see for extended infusions from the DALI study uh, that those patients that received intermittent bolus dosing uh, about 60% uh, of the time did they achieve a, a therapeutic target. With extended infusions, it increased to 75%, whereas with continuous infusions, it increased to 95% of the time. So essentially, use of prolonged infusions, be they extended infusions or continuous infusions, dramatically increased the likelihood of it, um, achieving a, a therapeutic target. Uh, data from the BLING study specifically for continuous infusions, this is the BLING-1 uh, study of uh, 60 patients, uh, there was a, a much greater difference in the 100% the time above MIC, so where the, the concentration of B-lactin was maintained above the MIC throughout the whole dosing interval was 82% in the continuous infusion group versus 28% the bolus dosing. What about therapeutic drug monitoring? Well, this is something which only really came into being in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, it has found its way forward for beta-lactans, as you'll see in Mo's presentation, because it's really the only way we can be sure that PKPD targets have been achieved. But the question is, well, what is this PKPD target that we should be aiming for? And there's a lot of controversy around this because the clinical data does not necessarily align with what the preclinical uh, studies demonstrate. And so part of the reasons that there may be a, a different uh, PKPD target uh, may depend on the sickness severity of the, the patient, the nature of the infection, and whether or not uh, resistance pre prevention is being desired. Now, that is not only in the context of an individual's choice, but also in terms of the published studies and what PKPD targets have been chosen in those. And so because of that, in the literature, there's many different targets which have been, been chosen. Uh, and so that makes it quite difficult for, for many to, to find a solution for what target they should be choosing if they were to use beta-lactam TDM. So that uncertainty really does create some challenges for beta-lactam TDM because there isn't a, a very robust randomized controlled trial that has defined what should be used. So now I'd like to talk about the current status of B-lactam, TDM and prolonged infusions. Uh, therapeutic drug monitoring first. Well, how common is B-lactam, TDM? So the first report of B-lactam, TDM that I'm aware of uh, was published in 2009 uh, uh, and uh, by Francisco uh, Scaglioni and with much uh, larger descriptions following in 2010. In terms of international surveys trying to describe the number of hospitals that have access to TDM, uh, you can see that from the international survey uh, admin ICU, which was conducted in uh, 52 countries around the world, that there's about only six and seven percent of um, hospitals had access to carbapenem or piprocil and TDM. Uh, in the anti um, Bioperf uh, French survey, uh, these numbers were closer to 20% uh, and that was published in the next year in 2016. And a, a German survey, so these are both national surveys, uh, found similar results to the French survey in 2020. Um, and that, uh, so that shows that, well, perhaps the, uh, is the prevalence of B-lactam TDM is increasing or alternatively, in some regions, it's just far stronger. And I think that it's probably more of the latter than the former, although I do think that b lactam TDM is becoming more common as well, which actually demonstrates the need for us to find more data to um, justify the use of that as an intervention. In terms of drugs, which are most commonly subject to b lactam TDM, they tend to be the anti-pseudomonal agents that are most commonly used. So piprocillin, keftazidine, and meropenem. Uh, I mentioned the issue associated with different PKPD targets and in the uh, multi-centre survey done of B-lactam antibiotic dosing also in 2015, uh, we, we listed some of what are those targets that are used by different uh, hospitals. And you can see there's very little consistency there at all, demonstrating the uncertainty that there is for 
this intervention. What is the effect of using TDM on the later achieving PKPD targets? Well, this is a, a study from one of our previous speakers, Jan de Valle, uh, and he was able to show that pre-intervention on day one, uh, this is looking at the, the top panel in terms of 100% time bar of MIC and the bottom panel in terms of 100% time bar four times MIC, so fourfold higher than the MIC, that uh, after TDM, that there was a significant improvement uh, for both of those PKPD targets when TDM was used and the dose was adjusted, as one would expect. What about prolonged infusions? So um, uh, again, in the admin ICU survey, uh, it was found that uh, the use of continuous infusions was less common than extended infusions, but still was somewhere between 20 and 30% for extended infusions and just under uh, 10% for um, continuous infusion. In terms of why people may want to be using extended versus continuous infusions, well, uh, extended infusions, of, of course, have that uh, convenience that they don't take up a whole uh, line throughout the 24 hour period, and that there, there's always a, a break which occurs at the end of the infusion before the next extended infusion starts. And so that's what this graphic from a a paper from Mika Kalia, who was a, a PhD student of Yandaval, uh, was able to demonstrate. And so this uh, black dotted line here represents the extended infusion time above MIC compared with the continuous infusion, the black solid line time above MIC uh, that was seen uh, with meropenem being administered by continuous versus extended infusion. You can see both of these are far superior uh, in terms of the time above MIC to what was observed with um, intermittent bolus dosing of meropenem. So in terms of a large study looking at target attainment of intermittent bolus versus continuous infusion in sepsis, uh, well this is a study, um, of the, this is a bliss study uh, which was a study performed by um, uh, Dr Hafiz Abdul Aziz uh, in two Malaysian uh, ICUs and essentially showed that there was a, a numerical improvement in um, the magnitude of the concentration for both piperacillin and meropenem as well as kefepenem compared with bolus dosing. Uh, and then when um, all combined together that the PKPD target was more consistently achieved with continuous infusion, which isn't particularly surprising. But what was important to the Bliss study is that uh, there was a, in this larger study of 140 patients, that there was a significantly improved clinical cure with use of continuous infusion. This uh, clinical question was then advanced into the BLING2 study, uh, which was this time enrolling 430 uh, patients. Uh, and um, what was observed here is there was no difference at all in clinical outcome. This study was performed mostly in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, whereas the Bliss study was performed in uh, Malaysia. Uh, and so there's obviously a different case mix of patients that are present there. Uh, but what was observed is there was an improvement in mortality, so reduction in mortality uh, for continuous infusion if the patient received at least three days of therapy. And it was not patients that were receiving re replacement therapy because those patients are likely to have reduced clearance and so will have elevated concentrations anyway. Uh, subsequent to this, an individual patient level data meta-analysis was performed, uh, combining the two bling studies and the bliss study uh, and looking at hospital survival and essentially showing that um, use of continuous infusion and this meta-analysis of uh, 632 uh, subjects favoured continuous infusion. Uh, and then looking for a uh, Cox regression analysis of 30 day survival curves and looking at the covariates which were associated with uh, a worse outcome, including increasing age, increasing Apache 2 score, uh, infection with a non fermenting gram negative bacilli, as well as, as other characteristics as well. Uh, essentially demonstrating patient groups in whom we should be applying continuous infusion or alternatively patients in whom, if we wanted to use therapeutic drug monitoring, that they're the kind of patients that are gonna benefit from personalized dosing. So BLING3 is a, a 7,000 patient study currently underway. Uh, I see that the, uh, the lead investigator, Jeff Littman, is currently on this, uh, this call, which is, is great to have him present. 
Uh, we've got 96 ICUs actually participating in this and over 5,000 of the 7,000 patients have now been enrolled. I wanted to finish with one paper which actually looks at both the combination of prolonged infusions plus therapeutic drug monitoring. And this is a study from Daniel Richter uh, who worked with the Heidenheim group in Germany who do some fantastic uh, observational uh, pharmacokinetic research as well as other interventional studies as well. And what they performed in this was looking at continuous infusion of piperacillin uh, in combination with therapeutic drug monitoring, we were able to show that they could double the number of patients that would achieve the PK target with use of therapeutic drug monitoring. So that's a, a great result to have uh, such a good proportion achieve their target, which was a, a steady state concentration of 33 to 64 milligram per litre. What they also observed is if they did achieve that target, the patients had a much, uh, well, statistically significantly lower uh, hospital mortality, uh, as well as a lower ICU mortality as well. So that's um, a very interesting paper published in an infection a couple of years ago by Daniel Richter, and I commend um, many of you to read that. So what are the conclusions about this that we can make? Well, I think that something that is very important is that not all patients need this um, form of dose optimization. But predicting who are those patients that need it can be quite challenging. And so some of those <clears throat> risk factors for mortality from those previous studies actually can help inform that. I think that prolonged infusions are, are really an easy intervention that anyone could make uh, that increase the likelihood of achieving a PKPD target. And as we've seen in some of those small randomized controlled trials and those smaller meta-analyses uh, are able to improve outcomes for patients. However, I would highlight that therapeutic drug monitoring really is the only approach which can ensure all patients can achieve PKPD targets. And so the answer to this question really is, is that continuous infusion is a great way to start therapy or extended infusions are a great way to start therapy, but you can further optimize exposure with use of therapeutic drug monitoring. But I would suggest that we do need uh, some large interventional studies which are, are able to, to truly test the outcome of this in these um, key patient groups that I've alluded to before. So thank you everyone for uh, your uh, time and listening to my presentation. Uh, I'm just now going to stop sharing the screen and look to see if there's no any questions, which there's not, which is, which is fine. Uh, but it does allow me to now introduce the next presentation, which is from Dr. Mo Alshir from the Infectious Diseases for um, pharmacokinetics laboratory in Florida, uh, USA. Now it's very early there, it's about uh, 3 or 4 a.m. Uh, if memory serves and so Mo has kindly recorded his presentation uh, which Luminita will share very soon. But I, I've deliberately invited Mo to present because uh, he works with the great Chuck Pelican who is a uh, uh, will be well known to many of you as a, a real leader in clinical pharmacodynamics and uh, it, I'm very interested to hear what the approach of the Americans is with use of therapeutic drug monitoring.